Right now, a scenario we would all like to see is the fall of Putin and the collapse of his entire regime. At the end of the day, this is one of the reasons behind the sanctions program to turn Russian elites against the great leader. So we are talking about a campaign of isolation that goes far beyond trade. The goal is to get to the heart of all Russians. For example, four years ago, Russia was hosting the World Cup. In the upcoming one in Qatar, they are not even allowed to participate. However, Putin himself is also starting to play too much with the emotions of his people. Check this out. Putin's call-up fuels Russians' anger, protests, and violence. To give you an idea, according to Forbes, more than 700,000 Russians left the country in just the two weeks following the announcement of mobilization. Can we trust these numbers? Well, the truth is that it is relatively easy to count them. You just need to add up the figures given by the host countries. Of course, there might be errors. But, in theory, it seems reasonable to think that hundreds of thousands of Russians are fleeing the recruiters. We have also seen all sorts of street protests and campaigns on the internet. Think about it. It is one thing to support a war you see on TV, accompanied by the appropriate propaganda, it is quite another to support a war where you are going to be told to fight on the front lines yourself. And the truth is that this is not the first time that this has happened in Russia. That's right. If we look at a little bit of history, we'll see that before Ukraine, Russia has carried out two large mobilizations, one in World War II and another one in World War I. During World War II, almost all Russians understood that they had to fight. After all, they were being invaded by Germany. However, the mobilization in World War I ended really badly for the Kremlin. In this case, a military mutiny broke out, a mutiny that was key to the fall of the Tsars and the rise of the Bolsheviks. That's correct. In today's video, we're going to look at, in detail, what happened in Russia in 1917. So the question is, what does the Russia of the Tsars and Putin's Russia have in common? Could the war in Ukraine bring about regime collapse like the one that brought about the revolutions of 1917? Today on Visual Politic, we're going to answer all of these questions, but First, obviously, we need to look at some history. The February Revolution No, I have not made a mistake. I did just say the February Revolution and not the October Revolution, which is the one we all know about. And the fact is that months before the communists took control of Russia, another revolution took place. This time, a liberal revolution. So you may be wondering what exactly happened. Let's find out. The Russian Empire was going through a period of extreme decadence at the beginning of the 20th century. The reforms to modernize Russia and bring it closer to other European powers had been cut short with the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. His successor, Alexander III, returned to the old formula employed by the Romanovs for three centuries, a mixture of orthodoxy, autocracy, democracy and nationalism. That is, the classic idea of Tsarist Russia based on loyalty to the Romanov dynasty, government, traditional religious faith and glorification of the motherland. His son, Nicholas II, did even worse. He first waged a war with Japan that led to one of Russia's greatest historical humiliations. The discontent provoked the revolution of 1905 in which the Tsar made some symbolic concessions such as the creation of the Duma, a parliamentary assembly that, when it came down to it, lacked real power. But later, in 1914, he became the defender of Serbian nationalism and involved Russia in the Great War, the First World War. Russia faced Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the war. Despite initial victories over the Austrians, the Russian army was crushed by Germany, causing thousands of casualties. The front was stabilized and Tsar Nicholas II left for the front to lead his troops. Despite the success of the Brulisov offensive based on half a million casualties, Russia was soon cornered again to suffer defeat after defeat. 1917 began in Russia with a very cold weather and high inflation. The majority of workers in St. Petersburg, or Petrograd as it was known then, had to choose between freezing or trying to keep warm at the risk of starvation since an egg cost four times as much in 1914 and butter five times as much. In addition to food shortages and extreme poverty, 1.7 million Russians had died in the war. Another five million were wounded. 1.5 5 million had been taken prisoner and just as many had deserted from the army. The protests were continuous and more and more numerous. And no, we're not talking about the Bolshevik revolution. We are talking about the one that took place months before. This was not a communist revolution, but a liberal revolution. In this case, the Tsar tried to put down the revolt by force, but the various garrisons of St. Petersburg revolted and disobeyed the orders received. A week later, Nicholas II abdicated. Tsarism was replaced by a provisional government that was decided to continue Russia's participation in the Great War while respecting the international alliances in which Tsar Nicholas II had involved the country. The problem with this provisional government was that it was very weak. In the streets, the Petrograd Soviet, a sort of workers and soldiers council in what was then the Russian capital, today St. Petersburg, was becoming more and more powerful. While the most radical revolutionaries, the Bolsheviks, were gradually growing stronger in the Petrograd Soviet, the Russian provisional government was composed of liberal politicians, moderate socialists, and socio-revolutionaries like Alexander Kerensky, who soon became Minister of War and the Navy. At the head of the army, Kerensky played an all-or-nothing game. What did this desperate attack to avoid defeat in the war consist of? Well, we're going to look at that right now. The Kerensky Offensive 
Russia had committed itself along with allies to launch an offensive to divide the attention of the German and Austro-Hungarian enemy on two fronts. But the Russian army was not at its best. Discipline had fallen sharply after the abdication of the Tsar. The troops didn't trust the commanders because of the enormous number of casualties suffered by the Russian army. In addition, the large number of casualties had two fundamental consequences for Russia. Firstly, although the soldiers were still primarily of peasant origin, the latest conscripts in 1916 had begun to include middle-aged men. Secondly, and more importantly, the new recruits were being sent to the front with less training than their predecessors. So, they were cannon fodder. Does this sound familiar at all? Exactly. We're not going to say that history is repeating itself, but it is clear that there are a number of parallels. Putin's new troops will suffer heavily in Ukraine as they will have basically no training, UK Intel says. In 1917, this lack of preparation also affected the officers, particularly in the lower ranks. The senior officers were aware of all this and complained about the poor ability of the new commanders and the poor quality of the reinforcements received. But wait a moment, because they still had to deal with an even greater problem. the new arrivals at the front were opposed to the war and thought that the failure of the Kerensky offensive would sink the provisional government and would serve to achieve peace more quickly. Something similar to what many Russians in Ukraine might be thinking right now. Russian propaganda has sold the invasion of Ukraine as a military operation to fight fascism in the neighboring country. Russians therefore see the intervention in Ukraine as something completely unrelated to the day-to-day -day life of their own country. In the earliest 20th century, Russians also did not consider World War I as an existential issue. This is something that the Russia of the Tsars and Putin's Russia have in common, the lack of a clear ideology in running the country. It is clear that Ukrainians are struggling to survive as a country. They want to be independent and have a democratic political system similar to that of the European Union. But what are the Russians fighting for? Unlike the Soviet era, today the Kremlin lacks such a clear ideology as communism. In other words, the Soviets wanted to spread their revolution to every corner of the planet. Putinism, however, has no such international aspirations. Putin's approach is purely nationalistic. It is based on the idea that there is nothing better in life than being Russian, the old romantic notion of nationalism already exploited by the Tsars. However, in the 21st century, this is not enough motivation to compel citizens to go to the front, and even less when you consider the conditions in which the Kremlin sends its men. Anger mounts as Russian draftees thrown into battle with without training, equipment. The Kerensky offensive failed when Russian soldiers mutinied and refused to continue fighting. These insubordinations gave Germany time to reinforce its front and launch a counteroffensive. Far from bolstering the morale of the Russian army, the offensive proved that the morale of its troops was at rock bottom and that none of the generals could count on the soldiers under their command to execute the orders that they were being given. problems were piling up for the Russian provisional government, which by then had been pinned down for several months thanks to the brilliant idea the German enemy had come up with. Because someone thought, let's see if Lenin wants to negotiate peace with us. Why don't we take him out of his exile in Switzerland and bring him to Russia? And as we say here on Visual Politic, no sooner said than done. In April of 1917, a crucial historical train journey took place. Vladimir Lenin travelled from Zurich to Petrograd. He travelled more than 3,000 kilometres, or 1,864 miles, something that would have been impossible in the midst of the World War without German help. But Berlin's ambitions were quickly rewarded. Upon his arrival in St. Petersburg, Lenin announced the April Theses. He promised that if the Bolsheviks came to power, Russia would emerge from the war, give the land to the peasants, and power to the proletariat. It was the era of the historic slogan, all power to the Soviets. That's what it is like to have access to a mass agitator like Lenin. He knew perfectly well what the Russians wanted to hear. Today, the opposition to Putin does not have a leader, a role model to unite the Russian discontent with the war. And no one seems to be supporting the Russian opposition, at least not with the same intensity and above all, with as many rubles as the Kaiser's Germany placed in the hands of the Bolsheviks a century ago. Edward Bernstein, a German politician who is considered one of the fathers of social democracy, claimed that the German government financed the Bolsheviks between 1917 and 1918 with about $10 million of the time to help them take power. Today, Western support is concentrating on propping up the Ukrainian government, but supporting the Russian opposition was very effective a century ago. So how did the Bolsheviks seize power? Check this out. The October Revolution After the failure of the offensive, the provisional government led by Kerensky tried to reorganize the army by placing Lavar Kornilov in charge. This general, fed up with the chaos in which Russia was plunged, tried to establish a military dictatorship. To do so, he launched a counter-revolutionary coup d'etat. Kornilov failed, but not because of the opposition of Kerensky's provisional government, which by this time had really no power over anyone because no one believed in its authority. Kornilov ran up against the Soviets and fundamentally against the resistance of the Bolsheviks. This failed coup reinforced the loss of authority of the officers in the eyes of the troops, who saw them as mere 
were representatives of an authoritarian power that had to be ended. It also meant the definitive backing of the Bolsheviks, the most radical revolutionaries who guaranteed that there would be no return to Tsarism. The Bolsheviks demanded the government grant freedom of movement to the Red Guard. We are talking about detachments of workers who were armed and who would be decisive for the success of the revolution. The Bolsheviks rallied the workers and soldiers of Petrograd to overthrow the provisional government. A new executive was formed, led by Lenin, which took control of the countryside and created the Cheka, a political and military intelligence organization aimed at crushing any dissent. What's more, as they had promised, they signed a peace treaty with Germany, an agreement that meant an ephemeral independence for the Ukrainian Republic. The triumph of the October Revolution started a six-year civil war. The Red Army and the White Army, which comprised all of the enemies of the Bolshevik Revolution, confronted each other. The conflict completely devastated the country and culminated in the triumph of Soviet power. Possibly, today, the conditions do not exist for a revolution to overthrow Putin. In other words, who is now the main leader of the anti-Putin opposition? Alexei Navalny. Unlike Lenin in his day, Navalny is not in exile but in Russian jail, so it seems to be somewhat difficult to support him from the West. Even so, Navalny's allies continue to move. This message was launched in early October by Ivan Zdanov, Navalny's right-hand man who is currently in exile. It was time to restore our network to fight with mobilization. The problem for revolutions is that things have changed a lot since Lenin's time. The control over society, over the communications of dissidents, is much greater than was possible to have a century ago. And another of Putin's advantages is that he is not so worn out in the eyes of the Russian population. Fundamentally, because of the regime's propaganda, which does not try to convince Russians that the world needs Putin in the same way that, for example, Chavism extolled Hugo Chavez. It is very different. Putin's popularity has always rested on the apathy of the people, something similar to what happened during the Tsarist era. Russians have long understood that politics is Putin's and his friends' business. However, as the war in Ukraine is far from going as the Kremlin expected, the discontent is producing movements that months ago were completely unexpected. Which ones? Let's take a look right now. The Putin Offensive The Kremlin has doubled its bet with the partial mobilization and, as you can imagine, this does not come for free. As everyone understands, except from Chechen Kradov, going to the front lines is not any fun in general, especially without adequate preparation. What's more, by the time the draft was announced, seven months of war had already passed, more than half a year in which many had seen how their compatriots returned wounded or even dead. So some have dared to raise their voices against how the mobilization is being carried out. This is the case of the President of the Republic of Dagestan. The Republic of Dagestan is a Russian region bordering Georgia and Azerbaijan on the banks of the Caspian Sea. Well, the governor of this region is the man you see on the screen, Sergei Milikov. Sergei Milikov is no Putin enemy by any stretch of the imagination. He has a high-flying military career. He has risen to a high rank in the National Guard. He is now the highest authority in this region of Russia. However, look at what he has said about the recruiting officers of the armed forces. <laughs> Всем гражданам мужского пола срочно прибыть в военный комиссариат, при себе иметь военный бед. Вы что, дебилы, блядь, а? Кто их уполномочил ездить по городу? Это не что иное, как распространение фейковой информации look at it this way Dagestan is one of the poorest regions of Russia in addition it has a population of just over 3 million Melikov is afraid that many of those thousands of young people will not return and leave his republic even older but wait a minute because dissatisfaction with how Russia's partial mobilization has been organized goes far beyond an anecdotal problem in Dagestan It is an established trend. Russia's poorest and most marginalized regions are the ones that are risking the most in Ukraine. Russia's ethnic minorities lament the war in Ukraine. There are big unknowns about Russian casualties because, you know, that in wars, transparency is the first casualty. But there is research that clearly indicates that soldiers from the poorest regions of the Federation, such as on the border with Mongolia and Dagestan itself, are disproportionately represented among Russian casualties. Similarly, very few young men from the country's major capitals are dying in the war. Undoubtedly, a smart move on Putin's part because maintaining the loyalty of the elites will keep him in power. Revolutions in the 20th century spread from the cities to the periphery and never the other way around. This time, there will be no Petrograd Soviets, but beware of irritating the peripheral republics. So the question is, do you think that at some point Putin's regime may fall? Or do you think that his control over Russian society is so great that a revolution is completely impossible? You can leave me your answers in the comments below. And of course, don't forget that we have new videos here on Visual Politic every week. So subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of our updates. And if you like this video, like it so we know. All the best, and I'll see you next time.